All right, guys. Welcome back to Hear Me Out Podcast. I'm joined by my brothers BT and Franco, as always. How's it going, good gentlemen? And it's been well. a crazy week, man. Yeah, yeah man. We're here uh, with special guest today. We are here with D Pierce SSC. How's it going, man? Doing awesome. Like and subscribe to my personal channel, but it's uh, good to meet you in person, Pedro Silva, and also Brooks Warren. This is the first time we're talking together, and um, I'm excited to talk about the topic we're talking about today because it's a big one, right? Yeah. yeah. It's the biggest topic in all of media right now. It is, of course, the, uh, the George Floyd murder along with the ensuing riots that have been going on all over the country. We'll, we'll start off with, uh, with Pierce here. Um, so you, so Franco was asking earlier, um, are these riots, are they, should they be, or, or I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm miswording your question, Franco. Why don't you ask that question? How you? Yeah. So my, my question was, should these riots be happening the way that they are in the violent way, or should we be doing more of peaceful protests? Yeah, that's an interesting question. First, I think that instead of calling them riots or calling them lootings, we should call them protests because that's what they are. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot is happening in American society, and these protests aren't just in a vacuum. It's not just like, you know, this like horde of unknown black people like rioting. These are Americans rioting in America in the current American context of the COVID lockdowns. And in the COVID uh, situation, we have the COVID bailouts, which a lot of people don't know about. You got your $1,200, but they gave, you know, the Federal Reserve gave trillions of dollars to Wall Street. And what did, what did we have before? We had a financial crisis in 2007 and 2008. And uh, we also have the wars that the U.S. is dealing with. And no health care, no uh, education without being in debt. And the U.S. is in a particular place right now, right? It looks like we're on the decline and this is and like the, the riots as some people would put it, the, the lootings as some people would call it. The, I call them protests. I think they're an honest face of what America is right now because we're looking neither exceptional nor innocent at the moment. We're actually kind of looking like shit. Uh, so that is my start. I have a lot more to say but I'll I'll bet I'll bounce off you guys. If yeah. I could ask a question just to follow up off of what you just said there. Do you so you would say that riots would be in uh, that that's not a correct way to describe what's going on out there yeah it's a pejorative term used by the corporate media the corporate media is going to call them rioters and looters because those words have a negative context but mm -hmm. protest has like a more or less neutral positive frame and remember whenever corporate media is uh, reporting on a subject they're going to report on the subject in a system supportive manner for, for our audience that may not be aware of what that means System supported is not party um, affiliated. It is more like United States keeping order, keeping social control, making sure that you stay in your homes, do not protest, do not speak out against power and authority. So yes, uh, I believe that calling them riots is a system supported mechanism of the media at the moment to demonize the protesters. And one last thing uh, that I'm gonna point out, of course, this is a chaotic moment protests could not be 100% um, organized. And we're going to hear some stop stories about people that didn't deserve it, that are suffering. But I think that we need to connect, contextualize the protests in this current American moment, as opposed to hearing the sob stories that corporate media is strategically going to feed us so that the protests die down. Um, I am not positive on the radicalism of Americans. I don't think that these protests are going to keep up because we just don't really have that kind of culture. But if they do, I think it's a good thing. Uh, just to get off, or just to you know, go on the back of that, um, you know, we're we're living in a in a huge moment right now. You know, we're and we're, and we're exercising our our American right to you know protest and to express you know our anger, our um, our feelings about you know what's going on in society. Um, you know, this this isn't the first time. This isn't the last time that we're gonna get, you know, radical radical uh, protests. You know, things burning down, things things getting violent. You know, um, that's not that's how this country got started with the Boston Tea Party. This is you know what we're doing forever. You know, and um, we're doing. I believe that we're doing the right thing in you know protesting these things. Um, 
I wish that we didn't have to do that because, you know, this is getting disheartening. You know, it's, it continues to get disheartening. You know, you don't want to see these type of things and you don't want to get des- desensitized to these issues. And, um, you know, I feel like there's going to be a, a bunch of people that are going to get desensitized and, you know, not worry about as much as they should. I'm in the position of understanding why it's happening. I mean, the, people are fed up with the injustices that are happening in this country. And it's just a combination of a lot of things that have been happening in the recent years. And people are just, they, they want to unite, they want to be heard because the elites are not hearing these people out. But I will say that we need to organize better and not just loot any random thing. You know, don't loot a local business owned by, uh, you know, like the mom and pops, the mom and pop shops. Don't don't loot those things. Like I've been seeing videos of some people um, attacking those businesses. But when I see people destroying like the CNN headquarters or um, or Fox News headquarters or or like uh, Bank of America or other banks, I don't shed a tear for that. So the best way that we, our voices can be heard is not if we're attacking each other by attacking local businesses, but by attacking the people who are oppressing us, which are the which are the corporations and the people who are bought out by these corporate elites. Yeah, and I, I agree, Franco. Um, I'm not, definitely not going to shed a tear for the corporations because uh, I think it's the Target CEO or the Walmart CEO, whoever it was, saying, you know, I stand with what they're doing, but you know, and we can we can build we can rebuild these stores, we can rebuild these windows. You know, they're not that's not the issue at hand. The issue at hand is that you know we have another week of someone dying un, un, unnecessarily, and you know that should be the focus, not yeah. what's going on with the stores. Um, I just want to add to the back of this. Um, uh, sorry, Silva. I'm just gonna like very quickly. I think that the focus on property damage as opposed to uh, the black space that uh, black people occupy in America. I mean, this is a particular American moment where I don't think that America has historically shown that it really... I, and I don't want to racialize this because mm-hmm. I have a more class-based critique on politics, but yeah, like, this nation doesn't really do a good job of integration, and that's unfortunate. Like, I say that as somebody in the military, and we get along fairly well. Um, to add two last points... Uh, so, uh, excuse me, Warren, when you said that this is disheartening, I would say that this is heartening for me personally. I like to see people use their autonomy and at least express frustration as opposed to staying indoors amidst the COVID crisis. And um, Bruno, uh, Franco, like organized chaos is kind of a contradiction in terms. And I, I think that we're watching chaos and we can ask it for it to be perfectly organized. But if we're only ever going to protest and you know, demand change on the terms of the oppressors, which is the current corporate elite, our government, um, you know, who is now employing the military. I, I think we should mention that. Uh, you know, something's lost there. So focus on the communities that feel like they've been hurt and the reasons for the protests. I think all the property rights and property damage stuff, it's a distraction. Um, it speaks to the capitalism endemic in all of us. And it speaks to the ignoring of black people endemic in all of us. And again, I said I say this as a black person, but I have a master's degree in politics, and like I take a mostly class-based um, approach to politics. I'm not just like Mr. Black Politics guy. I don't want to come off that way. Well said. No, I wanted to piggyback off of what you guys are already saying. As far as seeing stores like Louis Vuitton and Gucci, those big stores, they got insurance on those stores. Yeah, They're exactly. Going fine. It was really nice to see. Uh, a lot of these businesses, uh, there was a couple black-owned businesses in Minnesota. They were outside ready to go preparing their, or, or protecting their store. We had uh, other people that were protecting, like, the uh, even they, they had some places that they were just there protecting others that, you know, small mom-and-pop shops that got broken down. Those are the ones that, that we, we send out, or I, I don't want to speak for you guys, but I send that out, you know, my thoughts and, and condolences to a, a smaller shop that gets broken down, like you said about that, but... I wanted to, to add a tweet that i seen today that, that really aged very well from Vincent Goodwell where he said, Colin Kaepernick's peaceful protest won't be fully appreciated until there's a protest that is not so peaceful. So 
he went out there and and had the whole kneeling before the anthem situation that basically cost him his job, which was a peaceful protest. And once that doesn't work, this is this is where people feel they need to. This is like the only way their message is going to be heard. How do you guys feel about people bringing up Colin Kaepernick's uh, kneeling situation? Uh, uh, should I go first? First, I'm in full support yes. of Colin Kaepernick and everything that he stands for. Um, I think that the distraction there... So whenever black people bring up an issue in America, it's funny because it always gets what about it into something else. Like, it got what about it into respect for the flag and why are you kneeling during the national anthem? But there's no concern for black people and what they're complaining about. And, like, this isn't, like, a new complaint. Um, I'm going to just generalize this because I don't want to go on too long. But what were we complaining about when George Floyd, is that his name? Yeah. When George Floyd was murdered, when Ahmaud Arbery was murdered, we were complaining about the underinvestment in the black community and the... Uh, criminal justice system, uh, their kind of strategic targeting of black people through um, incidents and uh, what would you call it, uh, happenings that are prevalent in all communities, but you know, we're going to punish the black people specifically for it. So, uh, yeah, whenever black people bring up this like worry that like the nation isn't treating them correctly or this worry that their their uh, communities could look better and their nation could invest in them better, it's like we immediately have to bring up why the black people are undeserving or we have to change the topic completely. So we saw that with Colin Kaepernick and we're seeing that with George Floyd. There are a ton of right-wingers, and I do not respect conservatives in these moments because they never make an offer – uh, they never throw like a fig leaf to black people, but then they wonder why black people vote for the Democratic Party in mass, even though the Democratic Party also isn't, you know, offering black people anything at the moment. Electoral politics has failed black people, and um, I will just say this is a moment that has kind of solidified my personal belief, like 100% solidified my personal belief that I think that people should arm themselves. Uh, I think one of the first weapons you should buy is a, a is a small shotgun. It's very easy to manage uh but a handgun. and a handgun if you if you can uh but i would get a shotgun first because there's a lot of there's shotguns are interesting um just look that up audience but yeah like man when it comes to this nation and how it sees black people and the the way it takes the concerns of black people and always turns it into another issue whether it's property rights or respect for the flag it's like listen to black people black people aren't this like Thing over there they are Americans are you an American do mm -hmm. you care about America right. what is the lifeblood of a nation but it's people we are a mixed community and if we can't do diversity right then America cannot survive yeah one, one thing um, I, I will say is that with the Kaepernick thing it was much easier for people to just like you know wag your finger and like complain and moan about that when it comes to these protests that are happening now this is creating more of a discomfort you know do you think that that police officer would have been charged or fired if it wasn't for these protests like we've seen priorly. Like this is a question that I asked on Big Talk, Little Talk, and I'm curious to hear what you guys think about that. Absolutely not. Um, you know, and it, it comes down to the fact that, you know, these issues, these things that are happening are being televised. You know, we're, we're watching these things happen, you know, not live, but, you you know, we see these things happening, um, you know, and you, you, whenever these things happen, you see sometimes people talking about, oh, you know, rest in peace to George Floyd, rest in peace to Ahmaud Arbery, rest in peace to Trayvon Martin, and then someone will say, you know, take notice of my friend, you know, he, he got killed in Florida because, you know, police brutality and, and all these other things, and, you know, when things don't get televised, like George Floyd's has been, you know, things get sucked under the rug, and... You know, when they get something under the rug, no one knows about it, like, like I'm trying to say. Um, it's just, when you don't, when you're not aware, when you're not aware of these things, you, you can't be mad about it. So, the awareness is the biggest thing with these issues. And uh, Pedro, not to pick on you too much, but when uh, you made your previous video, which was, uh, which was uh, really well said, um, the, the one part that I had like a gripe with was when you said that we need Obama to like calm things down. <laughs> but um, what what happened <laughs> no, 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 during no, no, those... Don't, 
I'll twist my words. Hold on, hold on, okay, hold on. Okay. What I said was, what we need is like a leadership statement from somebody right. like Obama. Like we need Obama's, you know, I'm not saying, and I said policies and, and all the other stuff aside. I'm just talking okay. about from a leadership standpoint, like short term, you know, get everybody, you know, in the like in like a come down kind of mindset because there's just no question that Obama is is much better at addressing national crisis than than Donald Trump has ever been. So that I mean, that that's that's what I meant. I, I didn't mean anything about policies. I didn't mean anything other than just short term, nothing long term when I said that. And I even said that in the video. Yeah, it's just that, um, I think what, you can like giving speeches, like making things like kind of brushing them over and story timing us into yeah, like but then this, uh, putting a mask over what the systemic problems that are happening, right? Uh, yeah, I think that that's Barack what Obama Frank said that this that like that uh, Obama's Obama's tendency of sweeping things under the rug has kind of led us to where to where we ultimately are. It was like already. What you were saying was it was bad with Obama, but Trump put the ugly face on it, and then that's when it started going in the wrong direction. That's what you were saying. Um, it just the direction just continued under where Obama was, like where we were. Um, then under Trump, things he just put an ugly face on the ugly things our country was already doing. Yeah, honest face then is a better word than ugly. Yeah. And Honest I'll just say a quick about Obama. I think that the hoodwinking effect that Obama has had on the black community has been one of the most disastrous things that I've seen. Well, rather that I've, that I've studied, um, you know, again, I come at this from like a perspective where I love politics. Like I love thinking about this as a subject and Barack Obama on the black community, uh, black people historically uh, supported the wars abroad, mass surveillance and, and the bank bailouts during his tenure. So it was like, I don't know, it was also a black community failing where they kind of took his success and used it as a vector or a cipher for their own community's success, but it was actually a complete disaster, complete disaster. I I mean, if you're a black person, I think you are fine with thinking that Barack Obama might have been one of the worst presidents that America has ever had, uh, but if you want to just look at that objectively and take race out of this, then, you know, I think he's still pretty bad, but... If you're black and you're looking at Obama, it's 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 bad, man. It's really bad. One I thing there's no Obama. question of uh, one one thing there's definitely no question about is that a lot more people are are politically aware nowadays than they were during Obama's uh, presidency, and, and, and going to even like younger ages, people that are that are in high school even are starting to learn more because a lot of people feel like they have to, as opposed to when Obama was in office, they didn't feel that urgency as much so yeah. that much is is you know pretty clear to see i hope you're right Pedro. Yeah. i i hope i'm right too man i think i am though i think i am i think i'm right on that i think it's a multivariate thing where it's not only just trump but it's also like what bernie was saying in the 2016 election when he was running against hillary where he really opened my eyes and a lot of other people's eyes about you know it's not just the republicans who are bad it's the democrats because they're both bought out by the same people who rule the country. I'm, Brooks, what are your thoughts about um, like Obama and like if he, he had he like put a nicer mask on the ugly things that are happening in the country versus Trump before, putting it before more you honest. Start, before you before you answer that question, Brooks, let's let's remember the topic is the uh, is George Floyd. Let's not go in too much on Obama. Oh yeah, for sure. Um uh, you know, for yeah. me, the, the more I, the more I, I uh, watch your videos, Frank Franco, and you know others' videos, um, and see like the complete opposite from people that aren't as aware or not, you know, researching things. I see his legacy kind of being more complicated than people like to think it is. Um, you know, this is someone who gave our community, gave the black community, you know, so much hope. You know, you see someone that's risen to the highest political position in the world and you want to see him succeed um you know and, and you and you tend to give him more of the benefit of the doubt and i think i have to agree with you pierce um you know we to our detriment we've given him a lot of credit we give him a lot of love you know he's someone who makes you really happy to see you know he, he gives you the nice smile he gives you that laugh you know he has the us in his speeches and all that and like he's very endearing and 
that just masks a lot of the, the uh, controversial things that he did. You know, you think about Syria, you think about the, um, you know, the deportation of, of kids, mass, or mass de- deportation. You think about this current Obama Gate situation. Like, it's a lot more complicated than people want to think. And I think we do have to open our eyes and be more aware of the issues that he did have as president. But in terms of like police brutality, uh, what are your views on what Obama did? Oh man, um, I mean he. It's, it's weird for me because like, it just it seems like we just became more aware of these situations as he was president. Like, the first thing that I think of, or not one of the first things, but the one of the legacies that I think of with him is like Trayvon Martin. And that was the first time that I ever saw, like, damn, like, look at this, like, look at this black child that's lost his life, and Obama's calling him someone that can be his son. Like, it's just, I think the police brutality in his in his legacy is a lot more complicated. Like I said, like, people are gonna say him being president made it a lot worse, and I don't know if I agree, but I do think that it's gotten just more televised. That's all. Go for it, Pierce. What you got to say? Small bounds. I think the theatrics of the Obama presidency kind of tricked uh, not only black people, but a lot of people into thinking that he was more substantial than he actually was as a president. If you ask Obama supporters, well, what were the five things that you liked best that he did? They're going to name some kind of social or cultural happenstance that he took part in. Uh, but we have to remember that the majority of what the United States does is foreign policy. And he expanded Bush's wars from two wars to six to seven, depending on how you measure these things, according to Wikipedia, but also other sites. And, and um, you know, you wanted to pull that out of Iraq, right? So he he did his best uh, on the rhetorical front while he was running on the campaign trail uh, to to have us perceive him as a progressive. But again, I use that word very specifically the hoodwinking effect of the Obama presidency, not only to recall the fact that he basically wore the KKK mask of some of the endemic racism that still remains today of America, you know, uh, America and its kind of endemic distrust and disregard of black people, and the fact that he took that trust of black people and just kind of, uh, it, it kind of allowed the system to be supported with this illusion of progress, which is unfortunate, but I said this would be a small bounce, so I would end it by saying that Barack Obama's legacy is one of the dreams and hopes and wishes that tons of people still hold, actually, or in hindsight, I should say, like, ask people, ask black people, what were your favorite policies that Barack Obama, um, you know, enacted? And they cannot recall, they cannot remember, because it's like they don't actually know, like, it's all about the theatrics and the way that he was perceived in the media on CNN, on MSNBC, and it's a damn fucking shame because I look at this as a black American, like, and it's upsetting because remember when, I mean, I don't remember because I wasn't born then, but we used to look up to figures like Malcolm X and Marcus Garvey and MLK, and MLK would turn in his grave to think that black people now revere people like Barack Obama and, I don't know, like Jim Clyburn and these assholes, like, who are these people? They're fake black leaders. They're fake black. It's rough. That last part is rough. Yeah. Yeah, and see, I, go I ahead, look but... at it from a different standpoint than, than, I, than I guess you, but um, there's definitely no question over the last couple of years, like, I'm just basically what Brooks said, watching these videos that Frank analysis comes out with another and seeing what other people say about Obama. It, it is a much more complicated legacy than, it, than than we may have known initially. Yeah, I mean, when I like just to before we get off that topic, I meant that only from like a like calming the, like you guys down say, kind of way. It's, it's just the soothing words short-term, super short-term, but at the end of the day, that's not what people are looking for. They're not looking for short-term answers. They need long-term, more permanent answers. So I can understand why you would have a problem with that and why other people would probably look at it and be like, no, we don't need that guy. So I, I understand where you guys are coming from. So yeah, and I'm sorry to change the topic uh, from George Floyd to Barack Obama. I mean, that warrants its own. No, it, right it relates because yeah, it's, no. it's a whole systemic thing <laughs> that... However you guys want to, like, separately, 
it's, like, it's a whole systemic thing, which is, you know, influenced by people who are in power. And Barack Obama was one of those people who were in power. And that influences people who are like working class, who think that they have that everything is taken care of because of uh, their perception of the leaders that are um, in charge at the moment. So yeah, I, I, I go ahead. Go ahead we, were talking, we, were talking about, we were talking about George Floyd and uh, the protests, and then we got on to Obama. But I don't think it was like a, I don't think it was a, an unrelated topic. You know, if we're talking about what I think is more important, kind of black politicality in America, which I think the protests speak to more than property damage, but also the protests speak to kind of like an underlying uh, disintegration of American society. Uh, under the hands of the corporate elites and our one-party system, uh, it's it's related. So the last thing I want to, I, I would like to like hear from you guys is what are your ideas for solutions? Like I see many Democrats coming up with uh, like like Democratic leaders on their Twitter posting things like this is why you should vote, this is why you should vote. But what what are oh God better solutions other than just voting that you think we should do in order to end this? systemic uh, situation we're in with like police, you know, killing uh, unarmed black men and, and, and things of that nature. You want me to go first? Go ahead, yeah. Go. All right. Um, I mean, number one, we have to, ref we have to just reform police, these police trainings as well as just lengthen training itself. Like it shouldn't take, what is police training like? What four, four or five months long? It shouldn't take that long to become, you know, a, a law officer, a public official like that. Like, you need a lot more training and understanding of of issues going on in the neighborhoods that you cover than just that gives. And I also say that um, and this is something that was sent to me this morning from my auntie. She mentioned she sent me an article about um the Supreme Court. She they're going to be doing a ruling on you know sometime this this coming week on something called qualified immunity which basically shields public officials from you know uh liability when they commit these type of issues commit these type of crimes you know co corruption all of that and i think that's something that we need to roll back and basically not get rid of i would say but just reconsider and make sure that we are able to hold people accountable for murder for corruption for all these things because Otherwise, it's going to continue to happen. I was thinking one thing that that people could do, the entertainers that people idolize so much, they need to get more aware on these things and speak out about it. And they need to terminate mm -hmm. ties with certain uh, certain corporations that they're, that they're doing business with that support uh, things that will be counter uh, counterproductive towards ending like police brutality and, and other issues that we're having right now. So entertainers or people with influence trying to uh, help shift the narrative because so many people watch them and they like to emulate and, and whatever they do is, is what they end up putting in their own like behavioral tendencies and stuff like that. So people with a lot of social media influence, entertainers, uh, athletes, you name it, we need more of them uh, on social media addressing it and cutting ties with people that support that kind of stuff. Make the companies feel it by losing those uh, partnership dollars. And um, before I get to my point, I want to bounce off of what Silva said about, um, I think it speaks to a kind of boycott, divestment, and sanctioning of businesses that are supporting uh, particularly nefarious actors. I mean, you can see this with Jay-Z and his deals with the NFL as the NFL works to stymie black voices. Um, so definitely taking away... The, or, or rather, I should say, the people that are paying the paychecks of the oppressors, you have to hold them just as accountable as the oppressors. And to the extent that those people who are paying the paychecks can pull out from that, like if Jay Z could stop his deals with the NFL and work uh, towards a world where Colin Kaepernick is more spoken towards, that is a better Jay Z and a better world. But as of now, we have like these kind of fake black leaders. But now I'll get to my point. Uh, so I want to reemphasize that whenever black people ask for something, they're kind of put in this position of like infinite suspicion and infinite disregard. How long? I mean, 
uh, Bert, you were talking about this. How long have black people been asking for criminal justice reform? I think it's pretty much like one of the first things that black people were asking for after they got the right to vote. And it's 2020. I mean, when was the Voting Rights Act? When was the Civil Rights Act? So black people have been asking for some of the same things for so long. And what has the Democratic Party offered? What has the Republican Party offered? So it kind of shows you that to some extent, you cannot find your answers in the electoral politics sphere because America will allow you to call yourself an African-American, but really they just consider you an African. So, um, yeah, just the skepticism and the disregard and the, like, whenever it's like a black moment in the U.S., people immediately start talking about something that can make the black community culpable Chicago, for it. Chicago, what about black on black crime? It's just it's stupid. Yeah. It, it's immediately about, what about black-on-black black crime? What about rap music? What about the fact that all, all you guys want to do is be singers and, and, and football players? It's like, you've been raped, and because you have you weren't an angel when you were raped, you don't deserve to complain about the rape. Um, and finally, so I know this is a hard transition from, uh, again, I want to reemphasize that I don't come at this from like a Mr. Black Politics perspective, but this is a particular moment, right? I don't want to seem like I'm just like, <laughs> I don't know, because I feel like I'm, certain Americans turn, tune out. They tune out when it's like too much black politics because it makes them reconsider their own particular position in their own country. But we live in a particular nation that is very violent towards foreigners, not just black people in America, but Arabs uh, abroad. Um, and uh, yeah, just to finish out my statements, what can you do to make things better? Create media share, have good conversations like what we're doing today. Uh, Silva, Brooks, Franco, I keep re-emphasizing this. I'm going to get bored uh, of saying this over and over on all the people's channels whoever, whenever I get interviewed, but this is where it starts. You unplug people from the matrix, keep doing that. Talk to the youth about how terrible war is and put the U.S. in its context. Don't allow yourself to be story-timed by, by the Obamas of the world Learn what your nation is doing. Learn how corporate media is evil and you need to listen to more independent media. Let's keep talking to each other. Let's keep having good conversations. And that's the way forward. But don't just depend on your vote, you know, because your mm -hmm. vote just comes from you watching TV every two years and then pressing a button every two years. It's like, you know, I think it's more about what we do on the ground. You have to talk to people, especially the youth, because, I mean, in some cases, the boomers are kind of lost. But... Yeah, man, uh, keep talking to people. Keep having honest conversations and try to unplug as many people as you can from the matrix. The last thing I want to say before Pedro closes this off is a solution that I think, in addition to the great points uh, the three of you brought up, is that we need education reform. We need to implement more subjects on like spirituality so that people can understand each other better. You know, Put yourself in other people's shoes and understand why they believe in the things that they believe in. Um, teach them more philosophy, have study abroad programs, make that a requirement so that people understand how people live in other countries, um, how those communities are structured. Um, so just implementing more structure in our education system that allows us to understand each other better and analyze certain situations better rather than just being reactionary when you see something and not even analyzing the things that you see on the TV screen. So uh, that that that's my closing statement. Beautifully said. That that's the main thing, the main root of all the racism and and hate, the the negative feelings that comes from not understanding each other. And and that's what what you just said is a excellent suggestion. We need to have uh, we need to teach different things in school. And if they're not going to teach it, we need to we need to be pushing it out independent media, having these kind of conversations, keeping it relevant, because a lot of these things, they come and they go, and, and they need to remain more uh, relevant when you speak about it more often. Gentlemen, fantastic episode. We have, uh, damn, I was going to, D. Pierce, we got uh, SSC, yeah, I screwed that all up, but great like episode. Like and subscribe, have a YouTube channel. <laughs> Like and subscribe to this channel. Where can we find you on, on social media and all that? Oh, yeah. Um, I'll just name two things. Like and subscribe to the channel D. Pierce SSC. Um, like my first name is David D. Pierce SSC. And you can also find me on Twitter at D. Pierce SSC with no spaces or dots or anything like that. Um, and I want to thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate this. Again, I think this is the move. 
And when I started my YouTube channel, I underrated how social this is. And I just love meeting and hearing different voices. And, you know, this is, this is the move. I feel in my gut that the more conversations we have with more different people, keep unplugging people from the matrix, I think the better that we're doing. All right, gentlemen, that's our episode for today. Hear Me Out podcast. Make sure if you made it to this part, if you made it to this point in the video, leave a like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you don't <laughs> miss any of the latest sports, progressive politics, pop culture, and see you guys next That's the weekend. Bye. Thanks for watching that segment of Hear Me Out. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell down below so you can get the latest on sports, pop culture, and progressive politics. Stay informed.